Good afternoon, and thank you, PopTech, for bringing me over. Thank you for a really warm welcome, and, and thank you, audience, for still sitting. <laughs> I know you are really tired, and I can hardly see you, but as, a, as an experienced teacher, I can hear you. So don't try to sneak out. I will hear you. Well then. I suppose I was invited over to talk about my pedagogy and how it connects to resilience. As you can hear, it was not my pronunciation of English that brought me here. <laughs> but are you OK? Can you understand me? Yes. Yeah. I can easily switch over to Icelandic if you prefer. <laughs> OK, then. Then you just have to bear with me. Uh, in Iceland, I was talking about resilience uh, connected to the year of 2008, this famous year in Iceland when we broke all world records in our fin financial crisis. While well, the boys call it the financial crisis, I just call it the econo economical change because we have done this before. This is nothing new. But our banks, they're international now, and the guys had, well, they were stockbrokers and so on, so they decided this is something really huge and big. But I say just an economic change. But in order to talk about my pedagogy, I have to tell you the story of the nation, the story of my family, and then you will understand better what I'm talking about. Uh, we built this island in the North, uh, northern Atlantic Ocean in late 9th centuries. Uh, Norwegian Vikings were escaping from the king, the rules, from the taxes. And they went to Iceland but had a stopover in Ireland to collect women and workforce. <laughs> So, so more or less, we are the proud offsprings of Irish slaves and Norwegian criminals. <laughs> and you can still find it in our behavior. <laughs> well, we had our golden age for 400 years or so. An Icelandic Viking actually found America, did you know? Labor the Lucky? Do you know why we call him the Lucky? Because he found America and lost it again. <laughs> uh, but then, the little or small ice age uh, came to Europe. So for 500 years, we barely survived. Uh, I heard this morning from an Icelandic writer that uh, we have, in Icelandic, 50 words of dying. <laughs> you know, dying slowly, dying fast, dying inside, dying outside, dying in an avalanche, dying in the snow, in a snowstorm. I mean, we have 50 words. But we have only two for living. We have the word living, and the second is barely surviving. <laughs> so we are a nation. We are hardwired in our resilience. We have seen it worse, we always say. We have seen it worse. I mean, this is from, this is from 1950 in my, in my countryside, where I was brought up. Uh, think about it. Uh, after the Second World War, we, were the, we started to be rich after being the poorest country in Europe for decades, maybe for centuries. So here you have my family, 1950, but then development and technology came, and we did exactly what 
a lot of poor farmers did at that time. The family moved, left everything behind, a huge economical change, and a lot of people lost everything. Well, you can maybe see the red spot. That's where my family lived, in 400 meters above sea level. You can't even grow potatoes there, because the frost is never leaving the earth, you know. So we moved, the family moved, left everything behind, couldn't sell anything, and this was our Ellis Island, I suppose, a small, uh, a small town in the northern part of the, of the city. But we had what we, what we used to call the herring windfall. The windfall, I checked in the dictionary, a windfall. You get the concept? Yes. A lot of herring, and we just enjoyed life for a few years. We had so much. We, we moved from the countryside. We start working. My father started working in a factory, in a fish factory. And five years later, the economic change after the herring, you know, we were again a poor nation. And my father, a former independent uh, sheep owner, started to work in a wool factory with a depressed wife at home. And what should we do? No, continue living. As simple as that. And the nation, we have survived over and over again. Volcano eruptions, for example, this was uh, in the most important fish harbor, harbor excuse me, uh, in the, uh, yeah, for the nation. We had avalanches over and over again, destroying whole villages. I mean, there is nothing new in Iceland when it comes to disasters. Uh, you see the inflation here. Well, once we had 85% inflation, but what to do? Just continue living. I mean, I remember 1981, we had this bill, and you could survive for a month on one built like that. Today, you can't even go to a movie theater for this one. So I don't know where it will end. <laughs> yeah, maybe a million kroners. And then uh, life started to be nice to Iceland again. We had the most, most beautiful woman in the world, yes, 20 years ago. And we also had the strongest men. <laughs> and according to researches at that time, we were the most happiest nation in the whole world. But we had coordinated tests in Europe, and there we always scored the lowest. So we had <laughs> the most stupid kids. <laughs> as simple as that. And we had the strange gold season with the bank guys flying around, and 90% of the nation forgetting everything about the past. We thought this would last forever. But I'm not born yesterday. <laughs> of course it didn't last forever. And again, we have the geese and the boys with the money. They have, they have all, all of them have moved abroad. So we don't have to worry about them anymore. They're not living in the country anymore. Yes, they still have the money, if you want to know. But my point is, can we help children growing up with resilience? Can our methods, how we work around kids, can we help them to improve and strengthen their resilience? I think we do. I believe we do. And as I say, born in the middle of last century, I feel like I have tried, yeah, few, six, eight, 10, 12 economic uh, collapses. Uh, but 
It's as simple as that. We have always stood up and continued. And 1989, I started working with my own pedagogical model. Uh, I had been trying to look for something really useful and I didn't find any. So if you cannot find a solution, what do you do? You make it. I started with one kindergarten with single sex settings and with a lot of strange methods people thought at that time. We became the most uh, debated kindergarten in Europe. I read somewhere we were definitely the most criticized kindergarten in Iceland. And we worked with boys and girls separately to be able to give them the best possible situation to develop all the sides of their human, uh, human qualities. Uh, we are trying to work against their weaknesses of the boys' culture, we are trying to fight the weaknesses of the girls' culture, and we are trying to compensate to both boys and girls for what they haven't got in their uh, upbringing because of their gender or sex. Uh, I could talk more about that next year if you're inviting me again, Andrew. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you have to learn to master your own life not being afraid of looking into your own eyes and have your own opinions. We have developed a special uh, methods around children making choices every day. So they are always looking at the possibilities they have, deciding what am I going to do today. We are not just stuffing things uh, into them, they are able to make their choices every, every day. They are creating their own solutions. You are not going to see as much as one traditional toy in our kindergartens. And now we have 11 of them. They are working with open-ended material, something really demanding that they try their best. Uh, and when you are having uh, open-ended material from the nature, I mean, there is nothing you, you can uh, fight about or fight over. And you will really see how it reduces competition. Now we do the same in primary schools. We have five of them in Iceland today. Some from being really criticized. We are today, mm, we are pretty accepted in certain groups. But of course, not all. I'm really happy for that. The day when all Icelanders will be happy with me, something is really wrong. <laughs> so the girls here and the boys, they are making their own books. They are working with their own uh, things to, to study. Uh, and when it comes to uh, resilience, I think we have to break the frames uh, we built in our minds when about our thinking, breaking the rules. How are you expected to be? Break the rules, do something new, do something unexpected, like go through the window. Why using the door? <laughs> Who said you should always use the door? I didn't. So break the frames, break the rules. It's so important. And to paint, why do you have to paint on a piece of paper? The table is much bigger. You have much more space to do what you're doing. Try new things. Then one of my favorite is to teach kids to tolerate adversity. I learned this word adversity last summer. Yeah. I looked at it and found it in the dictionary, and I'm really proud of this word. Adversity. You got it. Adversity. I mean, go out with your bare feet. I mean, uh, maybe it hurt a little bit. That's great. I tell them, embrace the pain. My God, you are going to feel pain in this life. How lucky you are. Oh, did you hurt yourself? And if there... <laughs> 
And if they're bleeding, especially the girls, I do not give them the bandage or what it's called. Yeah. I'm taking maybe a piece of paper, putting their blood in the paper and observing it with the girl and saying, see how red and beautiful your, your blood is. <laughs> Think about it, how healthy it is. My God, you are really a robust one, daring to hurt yourself. Oh my God, I'm so happy with you. <laughs> And you cannot only break the rules and take in your decisions. We have to continue never to surrender, and we have to be in a community. That's why we are training discipline from the age of 18 months. Training discipline, wearing uniforms to strengthen our team feeling. It's easy for the girls to be in a row, harder for the boys. <laughs> training, being optimistic. You can train it like you can train everything else. Training mistakes. In our schools, we have a week of, of uh, mistakes. For a whole week, we are training just mistakes. And how we, can, how we can handle them, how we can just smile and continue. You have to research the world. If you are not researching the world, I mean, of course, you are not going to do any mistakes. But if you are going to learn anything, if you are going to try new things, you will make mistakes. And you have to taste the world, and you have to find out. And be responsible. Take a look at those guys. I never know when to say those or these. I have to ask you later on. <laughs> uh, be responsible of your surroundings, great boys taking care of their own things, and then you have to train courage, because courage is a big part, in my mind, of resilience, of being able to stand up and continue. Then you have to have the courage to start over again. Uh, look at these boys and the great girl. Just the teacher is training her, daring to jump, and tackling difficult tasks. My boys learning to knit. I remember uh, they were talking about, oh, this is a little boring, this is difficult, a little boring. And I said, you are really lucky today, training to be bored. I think we all should train that. Because it's so healthy to be bored. The life is not uh, comedian stand-up all day long, you know? So enjoy your boredom, my boys. Enjoy them. And then at last, concern and cooperation, closeness, feelings, especially for the boys, train them. A big one can help a small one if you just talk about it, if you give them the time in single-sex settings. You're not having a big mother being first. No, no, the boy is taking care of his friend. And then, least but, last but not least, we are mixing boys and girls every day to teach them respect, to teach them how to communicate, how to behave when you are with your friend, the boys, or with your friends, the girls. Because I believe the core of everything, when we are talking about resilience and how to build societies and continue and continue after crisis and so on, if we are having a society not fighting for equality, not fighting uh, uh, for the liberty from all gender roles, not fighting for the freedom of all human beings to do and be the best they can do, that's not a society worth fighting for. Thank you.